Hey, brother. Praise the Lord. I've uh, got a word in me. In First and Second Kings, going to be teaching on Elijah today. And praise the Lord, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. I just got to get it out. I'm excited about the word today. It's going to bless you. It's going to strengthen you. It's going to heal, deliver, set captives free. God is alive and he's amazing. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I want to uh, just remind you, last week I shared a couple of scriptures, um, you know, just to encourage folks, I don't know, I guess just prophetically getting things ready. You know, whatever is going to shake, I want you to know we're standing on a rock. So just, uh, just a quick review there. In Daniel, we reminded you what God said, that praise God, in the time of these kings, in Daniel it said, it's chapter 2, verse 44 and 45 we looked at. In the time of these kings, God's going to set up his kingdom, which will never be destroyed. So we're talking about that kingdom cut out of the rock. Okay, and that's that stone kingdom and that rock is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then he said, all these other kingdoms are going to fall. Every nation, every kingdom, every government is going to fall except for this one kingdom, his kingdom. Amen. And that his kingdom is going to spread throughout the whole earth. Glory to God. And then Daniel also tells us that, hey, all of these kingdoms of the world are going to be handed over to the saints. That's talking about you and I, folks. Okay, so I don't want to just plant that heavy in your heart. We win. We are the victorious kingdom of God. And then in Matthew, we said it last week, Matthew said, upon this rock, you know, Matthew 16, Peter's talking, he said, upon this rock, Peter said, Jesus is Lord, I'm going to build my kingdom. Okay, so I'm going to build my kingdom and praise the Lord. And the gates of hell, the powers of hell, the powers of darkness, the powers in politics, the powers of government, nothing's going to prevail against the kingdom of God in his church. And that's where we are. And praise the Lord. I mentioned also in Psalm 40, verse 2, he set my feet upon a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Praise God. We as a church, you as the body of Christ, we're standing on something far more solid than any political party, than any, any movement of government. You're standing on the living, breathing Word of God, and His name is Jesus. Amen? So we have this, and we're going to continue to stand. And praise God, He's commissioned us. Now, before I get into the message in Elijah, I want to go one more place. Go with me now to John chapter 15. And, uh, you know, we need to see uh, in shaking times of government and political things, we need to see what Jesus said about all of it. you got to have a big picture, okay? When you understand the big picture, then when things come from this year to the next, you'll see where it fits in. But praise God, we're a big picture. Um, we, we can know God who looks down at creation in all of the uh, centuries and all of the kingdoms, hallelujah, and He knows the beginning and the end, okay? So we have His Spirit, and we're seated in heavenly places with Him, and we can understand the big picture as well. So Jesus said this, okay, John chapter 15, and I'm look at verse 18. He says, if the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. Now, why would Jesus say that? Let's think about it. How does that relate to you as a family in 2021 here in Winsboro right now? He said, if the world hates you, I want you to remember it hated me, the living, breathing Word of God who created it all. It hated me first. All right? So he goes a little deeper. He explains that. He says this, If you belong to the world, it would love you and its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. If you're a born-again believer, I want to tell you something. We say it like this. We use this line and we say, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Well, that's where this comes from. Jesus talking about this right here. If you're a born-again believer... You are not of this world, okay? So you don't have to be so shaken about things that happen in this world. We belong to something bigger, something better, something eternal. 
Okay? Look at it again. All right? As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. How many are glad you've been chosen out of this crazy world? You do not, we do not even belong to the world. I'm in the world and we're passing through this world, but we're bringing in something better. We're bringing the kingdom of God from above to this fallen dark world. Okay? Hallelujah. We're bringing something better. Look, our, our role in our commission is not to change every um, government and everything around. It's to just to bring in something far different and far better, far above, bring the kingdom of God to this community, to the government, to the place. Bring the kingdom of God and usher in the kingdom. So we, and it's a different way of working it. All right? It's through His Word. The living Word of God is what brings in the kingdom and it brings it in one life at a time changing hearts through the Word of God, shining the light, making us stand by shining the light in the middle of a dark place, a fallen world, and let His, his light shine. So remind you this, praise God, as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. And he says this, that is why the world hates you. Man, you know, we're fasting and praying. Some folks met us here. On Wednesdays, some, some of us are fasting the day, and we meet here for lunch hour prayer. And while we're meeting here for lunch hour prayer, we're watching the news and seeing what's going on in Washington. And praise God, I'm proud of our folks. I, I just talked to Matt. He said he was standing in the middle in the Washington Mall there where the Washington Monument in front and the Capitol back, and it was a seat of, couldn't even move, wall to wall, a sea of people. And you know what? They were praising and honoring God. The rally for the USA, praising peaceful presence of God. Talk to Tommy and Hayes at somewhere standing by the Capitol. People having prayer meetings and worship meetings. See, it's bigger. Don't, don't let the news distort things and what's going on, the lie of the enemy. Amen. There's a sea of people who went, who are standing for the kingdom of God. Amen. The kingdom of God, Amen, and, and and standing for hey, I'm I'm a I'm a patriot and love the United States of America, taught uh, American history. Man, I love the fact that God used this nation. Man, I'm a fan of it to see, um, you know, Ronald Reagan say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear this wall down, and making stands for righteousness. And man, I'm the one that watches the black and white movies of D-Day and the world war films, you know? Hey, you know, I'm like, you know, that, that commercial about don't be like your dad who's watching these submarine films. Hey, I'm that guy, okay? You know, but I love it. But I see the history of his story of how God has used this great nation. But you know what? My loyalty and my faith is not in America. It's in Christ. Okay? And as I'm standing for Christ and standing for truth, if the world hates me and hates you, then you know you're on the right side. If the world loves you, Something's not right in your word or your life. It says it right here. Okay, there's coming a time, and the time is now, as Elijah is going to say, choose this day, you know, which side are you on? So look, keep in mind, this is Christ talking. God, who became a man, walked among us, and he said, if the world hates you, church, keep in mind it hated me first. If you're with me, you should be like me, okay? If you belong to the world, it would love you. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. So if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Folks, we're not here to curse the darkness. We're here to shine the light. Okay? You don't understand why people hate you and hate this and hate that. Well, I'm explaining to you real clearly. Because if you're in the light, the darkness will hate you. 
And that's to be expected. And we're just going to keep shining the light. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Expect it. Be ready for it. And handle it well. With a smile. And love. When they pluck your beard out and spit on you, Father, forgive them, for they don't realize what they were doing. If they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't act like this. That's who we follow. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. That's why the world is divided. That's why America is divided. That's why people are divided. Because some don't know the one who sent Jesus. They don't know God. If they knew God, they would act differently and think differently. So let's tell them about the Savior. Amen. Let's be about the Lord's business and tell them about the Savior. Praise the Lord. Now, man, Tyler Dean did a wonderful job showing us the main themes themes of first and second kings man i encourage you all as we study together reading chapters each day each night and studying kings with us okay i'm not going to be able to cover all of kings from the pulpit here on sundays but i want to get into a few aspects of it and today i want to talk about elijah so just a little history review remember where we are in kings you know you had the great king david who got things ready for his son to build the temple. He didn't realize it when the prophet told him, your son's going to build the temple. He thought it was Solomon, but what the prophet was really saying, your son Jesus is going to build the real temple. This is the real temple right sitting right here. Hallelujah. We are the temple of God. But anyway, it had to come in the physical realm first. So Solomon did build that temple. And I just want to say this again. In Solomon's day with the glorious temple sitting on that mount, hallelujah, in Jerusalem where God told them a long time before, hey, I'm going to show you where to go and I'm going to show you where to build the altar and I'm going to show you where I'm going to put my name. And he said, you're going to do it. And they had to go. And then finally they knew it was Jerusalem and the Ark of the Covenant was brought and the presence of God filled the place so much so it was awesome you could see the presence of God it filled the place and it was so glorious God gave them victory on every side in Solomon's day there was no wars coming against them because they had victory on every side they had peace the wisdom of Solomon hallelujah was known throughout the land it was amazing it was a picture of heaven it was a picture of when the king jesus returns to the earth and establishes his throne it was a picture of what's coming but it couldn't last because it wasn't the real thing this is the real thing we are the temple and this kingdom he's brought to our hearts he's going to come it's a spiritual kingdom now that's going to last forever but praise god when the king returns it's going to be a physical kingdom here on earth and you and i are a part of it and the nations of the earth and the kingdoms of the earth are going to be given over to the saints hallelujah who will rule and reign with him that's where we are man hallelujah praise the lord so in that day it couldn't last solomon fell to the wickedness of the world around him and uh, was led astray and the kingdom was ripped from him and given to his one son and another. It was divided apart. Israel to the north, ten ten of the tribes, Judah and Benjamin to the south, and it was a divided kingdom. And in this divided kingdom, as you're reading Kings, every one of the kings of Israel in that northern kingdom were wicked and evil. This is the time when Elijah steps on the picture with the word of God. Okay, so I've set that up to you see this nation that are supposed to be the people of God that has the word of God that have heard about and seen the miracles crossing the Red Sea, bringing them into the promised land, heard about Joshua and going in and the walls of Jericho falling, heard about going from one city to the other and capturing all of the land of Israel, the promise of the father, the promise that was given to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. They saw the reality of the covenant coming to pass when Israel was 
given to them and they had victory on every side. They saw all of that. They're the people of God and now they saw God come down in their midst living with them and they saw all of that and yet they could not continue. They fell away. Gosh, man. We who study American history and see the greatness of what God's doing, they're, wow, how can this nation fall away? Well, they did it in Israel's time and they'll do it again today. Study history, all of kingdoms fall. Okay? How can, man, with what God has done in this nation, so on, how can people fall away? Well, look at Israel. Look what God did for them. And they even saw his manifest present. It wasn't just like the glory you feel and sense in your knower. They saw it with their eyes. It shined like a bright light. Hallelujah. I see it right now. Hallelujah. But you see, it was, they saw all of that and they had the word and they had the law and they had the prophets and yet they fell away. You people, how? And some are questioning, how could America fall away? Well, they've done it all through history. How can this be? Is it sad? Is it wrong? Yes. Okay. Will there always be the word of God and a prophet to stand up and speak the word in the middle of darkness and stand for truth? Yes. Hallelujah. Will they always listen? No. They didn't listen to Christ and they hated Him. They will hate you also. Y'all all right with that? You still want to follow Him? Jesus preached some hard stuff. You got to eat my blood and drink my flesh. You eat my flesh and drink my blood or have no part. And many walked away. Am I telling you that they're going to persecute you and hate you? And so, hey, you want to walk away? Or you want to stand with me? I'm telling you now, it's going to get worse. But the kingdom of God in you and your life is going to get better. Because the peace of God is with you. Because you'll start understanding the victory you have. Because you'll start seeing it from the spiritual realm. Because as you're fasting and praying and reading Kings and following and getting together and doing that, you're going to start seeing things more clearly. And it's wonderful, I'm telling you. I got a down payment on what's coming already. The Spirit of the living God is a down payment or a foretaste of what's coming. So they saw all of this, and yet they fell. And all through Kings, as you're reading it, you'll start noticing something. You'll see this little line said, but yet they didn't turn away from the sin of Jeroboam. He did this and he did that, but they, they did as the sin of Jeroboam. This king did that king. What was that? What was the sin of Jeroboam? What did they do? Let's start there. First Kings, First Kings chapter 12. Turn with me there in your Bible. First Kings 12. Now this was when the nations divided and Jeroboam's now the king of the northern side, Israel. Then Jeroboam fortified Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. From there he went out and built up Peniel. Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now revert likely back to the house of David if these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple in, Jer in Jerusalem. They will give their allegiance to their Lord and Rehoboam, king of Judah, they will kill me and return to King Rehoboam, who's king of the southern kingdom. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. Folks, this is the king of Israel. They, knew, they remembered the story back in Exodus of the golden calves when Moses threw the law at them, and 3,000 people died the day the law came and killed them. Hallelujah. They remember that story. They were taught this stuff all their life, and yet they're going to Follow a leader who's going to build two golden calves to worship? Huh. Look at this. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it's too much for you to go all the way to Jerusalem for all of these feasts and festivals that the Lord has commanded in his law that you're to go for Passover and you're to go for Pentecost and you're to go for the Feast of Tabernacles. Hey, you don't have to go all the way down there. We're going to set up our own festivals here with our own gods. That's what Jeroboam caused them to do. He set up one in Bethel and one in Dan. This thing became a sin. The people went even as far as Dan to worship. 
And then as you're reading the rest of the kings, you'll see, oh, this king followed the way of Jeroboam. This king followed the way of Jeroboam. This thing followed the way of Jeroboam and the sin that he caused the people to commit. Man, there's so many out there saying, hey, let's take away the word of God. Let's take the prayer out of the school. Let's, let's take God off of our money. Let's don't say in God we trust. Let's don't say we pledge allegiance and, you know, to, the, to the flag. Let's don't, play, let's don't say that God is, is the center. Let's don't do this. Let's turn away from all the morals and standards in the word of God and let's do our own thing our own way and have turned and we see it. They've turned what? Half the country around already. Because the devil's a liar. And people who aren't standing on the word will swallow the lies and gone astray. Hallelujah. We see this, but this is not a new thing. We're not shocked as though we see where, how could people do this? If you read your word, you've been, know they've been doing it for thousands of years. Okay? But you've been called out, not of the world. You belong, you've been born again. And when you've do, do, been born again, what I've been emphasizing is you're a new species of people. You're not an earthly person anymore. You're like a Superman. So many kids like these, uh, you know, superhero things, you know? If you've been born again, you've been born from above, and you have the spirit of the living God living in you. You're not an earthly mortal being anymore. You are a supernatural being from another place with eternal life. That's who you are. You ever thought of it that way? You've been born from a different world. We're like an alien and a stranger in this world passing through for a short time, carrying the kingdom of God to anyone who will receive it. That's who you really are. So man, don't get bogged down in the junk of this world. We're not even of the world. Praise the Lord. We're going to stand in the face of the wrong in the world and we're going to shine the light of truth and say, whoever wants to come, come on. We belong to a different kingdom. Praise the Lord. So we see, you will see as you study kings, there's little paragraphs of this king and that king. And it always says he did the sin of Jeroboam. What? Turned away from the living God and started worshiping their own gods their way just like the Garden of Eden. No, God, I won't eat from the tree of life. I want to be my own God and do my marriage my way, do my kids my way, do my finances my way, do my life and my community and my government my way. Not your way, but ours be done. And that's what these kings, this is Israel now. This is the holy people of God supposed to be set apart, different, that have been given his law, been given his word. And yet they rejected him and turned away. Am I surprised when nations and governments turn away? No, I'm not. Am I saddened? Yes. Does it grieve us? Yes. Do we continue to make a stand? Yes, and always. Do we continue to shine the light as darkness? Yes. Do we want to hold that back? Yes. One more scripture before I get into today's message. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5, and speaking of the Antichrist, who has been in the world from the beginning, Antichrist, everything against Christ. Don't you remember, verse 5, when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back. Everybody say holding him back. In the King James, it says, he who letteth, it's an archaic word. It means stopping him, holding him back. And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed in proper time. Verse 7, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. Secret power of lawlessness of the Antichrist was at work way back then, and it's at big time work now. We see it every day. Okay, but then he says this. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. Who's holding back the lawlessness of the spirit of Antichrist? And then the lawless one will be revealed. I take that in my eschatology so far that the Antichrist will come 
when the one who's holding him back is taken out of the way. I believe it's the Spirit of God that's holding back the rest of the evil that's trying to take over the earth, and the Spirit of God is in us, so we, the church, is the one that's holding back the Antichrist, and he won't be fully manifested until we're taken out of the way. That's why I believe we're going to be raptured before the Antichrist is fully revealed. Now, will he be working on his governments? Will he be setting up a new world order through climate change, through this, through that, through some sort of world vaccine or world currency or world this or world that? Will he be getting things ready before he comes and be, is it revealed? Yes, but who's holding it back? The Spirit of God in us. Amen? So we'll continue to stand. We'll continue to speak truth. We'll continue to vote. We'll continue to pray. We'll continue to rally. We'll continue. But our focus is the kingdom of God in reaching people. In our first loyalty, as much as I love America, my first loyalty is not to this government or, the, or our, this nation. My first loyalty is to the king and his kingdom and his commission. And I'm reminded at the time of Jesus, Rome controlled Israel with horses and armies and soldiers, and Jesus didn't focus there, did he? Matter of fact, the only time they talked to him about Caesar, they said, hey, are you going to pay taxes? He said, show me the coin. Whose head is on it? Caesar's. Okay, give to Caesar what Caesar's but give to God what's God. And then he went on preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out the devils, and get ushering in a spiritual kingdom, not a physical one then. That's what Jesus did. In the middle of Roman oppression, he didn't curse the Roman oppression, he brought the light. I'm not going to curse the darkness, I'm going to speak the light. Y'all okay? Hallelujah. God is good. He's going to reign forever. And I'm going to rule and reign with him. Wow. So here's where we are in the nation of Israel when Elijah steps on the scene. 1 Kings chapter 17. Praise God. I'm right on time. There's been evil in Israel for a number of years. They're worshiping false gods in the wrong place. They've turned away from the living God and they're supposed to be the people of God. And God raises up His Word. Thank you, Lord. See, God doesn't exalt the minister or the church or the denomination. God exalts His Word. And Elijah had a word from God. Hallelujah. Amen? So let's see what happens. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither rain nor dew over the next few years except at my word. What a bold word, O oh God. Folks, you know, he couldn't have said that and went to a king who was trying to kill all the prophets of the Lord. See, Ahab was the most wicked of all the Israelite kings so far, and his wife Jezebel was worse. And she was always egging him on to do things bad. And man, she was helping feed the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the groves of all the places where they worshiped at the high places. And she was trying to stamp out everything that had to do with the God, of the, the real God of Israel, the real God of Judah. He was trying to stamp that out and kill all of the prophets of the true Lord. So Ahab in the natural would have looked crazy going to the king and giving a word. He's like turning himself in. If I give a word from the Lord, they'll know I'm a prophet of God and they'll kill me. But buddy, when you got a word, you got a word. Man, and nothing can stop it. Praise the Lord. God's given us a word. Do you know this church? God's given us a word here and it's spreading around to the corners of, the, of, of Louisiana to the, to the nations and, all, and nothing can stop it. Why? Because I, it's, it's like a fire in my bones. It's a word from God. I've given my life over to it. The living word of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's, it's what touches the lives. It's what changes people. The word of new covenant grace, the word of his truth, the word of the true gospel is what we have and God exalts it. 
and brings people to it because it's shining like a light in the middle of darkness. So Elijah comes and he says, man, there's not going to be any rain in the next few years until I say so. Well, Ahab didn't think much of it. He didn't believe it. I don't care what you say, man. Who are you? I'm the king of Israel, and we got all these other prophets and these other gods, and things are going all right. Okay? So go away from me. I'm not even going to listen. You know? And, uh, you know, after a while, God gave preeminence to his word, and everybody started thinking about the word the prophet said because it didn't rain. From the day he said it, it didn't rain. Now, what word was he saying? Every time a prophet, hey, prophetically preaching is enlightening to the truth of this word. See, the word was already given. Way back in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, it says, here's my people, and I'm going to give you the law of how to live. And if you obey this law of how to treat, how to, how to honor God and how to treat your neighbors, Here's the law of the land. It was a moral law, but it was also a civil law. It was their government law for all of Israel. Okay, God's law. And here's the covenant I'm making with you. If you obey the law, you're going to have rain. You're going to be blessed in your crops, in your field, in your children. Everything is going to be blessed. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to fight your battles for you and everything. But if you disobey the law and break my covenant, hey, this, the, curse is, the curse of the law is going to come. And here's one of them. It's not going to rain. You're going to have drought, and it's going to be like bronze, your, your land. It's going to be so hard and dry. That's part. So, so this word was already spoken way back by God through Moses to the people, and Elijah speaking it again and bringing it and making it reality in their present-day situation. Do you know we have a word all through, and we can speak it any time. And you can speak it and see it come to pass, or you cannot believe it and not declare it and see it not come to pass. Hello? The Word of God, we have, hey, like Elijah's been given a word. I've been given a word. You've been given a word. You've been given plenty of words. Now believe it and declare it and speak it like Elijah did. So the Word was already there way back in the law. And the people had already rebelled against God. And Elijah came and brought the word that was already there out and said, it's not going to rain. Just like God said way back in Deuteronomy, y'all aren't obeying God. Y'all aren't following God. It's not going to rain unless I say so. Man, it's powerful to have a word. To have a word from God. Jeremiah 5 says, my words will be in your mouth like a fire. Jeremiah 20 verse 9 says, his word in my heart is like a fire shut up in my bones. See, the word I'm talking about is alive. The word I'm talking about is Christ. He's the living word in us. It's like a fire. Hallelujah. When we have it and step out and obey it, we see it happening. When we speak it and declare it, we see things happen. We see mountains move and things shake and light come to darkness and set the captives free and heal the sick. We see it. Why? Because it's in us like a fire. And we, hallelujah, we speak it out and declare it and we see it come to pass. Amen. The Word of God is alive. Hallelujah. It's like a fire. Hebrews 4 12 and 13 says the word is living, it's active, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates. Man, you, when you come up against darkness, when you come up against darkness and evil and those who have been under the bondage of darkness, don't argue your points with their brain. Speak the word of God that has power to go to the heart and lay them open. We're not interested in arguing, winning political arguments this day. We're interested in speaking the word of God that has the power to cut the heart and lay it open. With a pastor's heart, I'm always wanting to patch folks up and put in the balm of Gilead and bring them out. I was hanging out with Kenny Linhart, who first one took me to India. We were talking to somebody and... Uh, you know, he needed a word. He was messed up in drugs and alcohol. And Kenny gave him a sharp word. It cut him open and he was like 
laid back and weeping. And, you know, it was real. It was true. It was a, the truth of how mess his life was messed up. And I quickly wanted to patch him up and say, but God loves you. And this, uh, he said, Ken, Kenny said, Pastor, let him lay open a few days. Let him bleed a little while and see how dark the darkness is and then bring the light. Let him see it. That, that word will lay people open. Sometimes we got to speak a word, and if it cuts someone, hey, let it cut. That's what the word will do. You speak to somebody about their marriage, their family, their life that's in darkness, and you just speak the word. If they get offended, they're not offended at you. They're offended at the word of God. And if they hate you, so what? They hate Jesus too. So we speak the word. Hallelujah. And the word can cut and open up. And then, praise God, we show them the truth and patch it up until they can turn and they can be healed and delivered. Glory to God. The Word is powerful. The Word is like a sword. Glory to God. Jeremiah also said the Word is like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces. Elijah had a Word. It was a Word of judgment, really. It was a word that's saying, hey, but it was a, for a purpose. The purpose of it was to show Israel how bad their sin was, that they had violated the covenant of God, but the purpose was to cause them to turn, repent, and come back to the true and living God. They had turned away and went to the false gods of their own land, perverting justice and everything else, and have gone so far that Elijah came and brought the word from back in Deuteronomy that you've broken the covenant and this is what's going to happen. But if you turn, hallelujah, I'm going to give you a chance to turn. But that came later. See, the chance to turn didn't come till three years after when they were in the middle of a drought and people were dying and starving and hungry and thirsty and animals were dying and everything else. And then came the showdown on Mount Carmel, which I'll preach next week. But for three years, the judgment came, and there they were. And now Ahab, who didn't listen at first, now he's listening. Now he's like, hey, Jezebel and your prophets, hey, you better you know, um, watch the food, take care of those guys. Hey, we got lots of food in the palace, but the people are out there starving. They're all mad at me and they're mad at us, and they've heard about the word of the Lord. Hey, now we better go find this guy named Elijah, who he didn't listen to. Now he's all important. The word has been exalted. Now every king around was looking for Elijah everybody wants to talk to him because they're saying, hey, whatever you said is happening, now we ask you to turn it around, talk to your God again for us. We need rain. You see? So Elijah gave the word, and now, now they're coming after him. Look at this. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, verse 2, again. The word of the Lord came again. He gave him the first step. Folks, when God gives you a word, hallelujah, you got to step out in faith and do it. Then he'll give you the next word. I've taught that many times. Some folks won't step out in the first thing he's telling you to do. And you're asking him for step five, six, and eight, and you haven't done step one. Come to marriage counseling and stuff, and I tell the people what to do because I know from the word, and they're not willing to do that. So, man, are you going to schedule six and eight more appointments? Hey, get this first thing done right first. Then I'll help you with number two. Hello? You know? Oh, your finances are out of whack? Hey, bring your tithes to the storehouse first, and then I'll show you what to do next. Until you obey that, how can God bless you with what's next? You've got to obey in the first thing. Hello? So then the word of the Lord came to Elijah after he obeyed the first time. Come on, when he obeyed the first time, God didn't say, you go to Ahab and tell him this, and I'm going to protect you and provide for you and not let them kill you. He just said, go and say. Elijah didn't know if they were going to kill him on the spot or not. God didn't say, I'm going to do all of this. He said, no, you go and speak my word. Okay? And he did. Now he says, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave there, turn eastward, and hide at the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. Let's think about that. What a wild supernatural story. I've been to the Jordan River, and there's all these little creeks from the land coming down to it, and everything in that area drains into the Jordan, which flows down to the Dead Sea. 
So here's one of the little creeks east of the Jordan, the Kareth, praise the Lord, in the name of it, the Kareth Ravine. Here's a little ravine, a little creek bed with some water in it flowing down the Jordan. I want you to go there, and I have already commanded the ravens to bring the food to you. You will drink from the brook, and I have, past tense, ordered the ravens to feed you where? To feed you there. Not where you are now, but where you will go when you obey the word. See, your provision and your protection is in the will of God. He has ordered the ravens to feed you there. Where is there for you? Where God spoke to you to do. He told you to get married. The provision is there. He told you to get your family involved in a church. Your provision is blessing is there. So you obey the Lord where he says, go there. He said, get involved in this, get involved, do this. When you go there, praise the Lord with the word, that's where your provision is. Not necessarily where you are, but where you're going when you're walking with God. That's where your provision is. It's can't, Lord, provide me a sack of food now, and then I'll go out to this creek you're talking about. No, he said, go there, and that's where I'm going to provide you while you go on the word. You got that? So he went. And the ravens were commanded. Now, there's all kind of cute stories about this thing. Where the ravens got, did they swoop down and catch fish each day? Or there's, I've seen like a Veggie Tales thing where they went into Ahab's palace and when he was cooking steak and stuff and all the people are starving, you know, hey, when governments take control now, you know, when communist governments take control and the people are starving, they're still eating real good, right? So there's famine in the land, but Ahab and Jezebel, they have, you know, they still got a lot of stuff left and they're still eating in the first and second year of the famine. And so maybe the ravens came down and took his steak right off his plate and brought it to Elijah. This is already supernatural, right? That a ravens, I've been commanded to bring Elijah food. Could the next step be supernatural too? Could he be bringing them crab legs? I don't know. You know? But whatever it did, he brought it to Elijah and where did Elijah find the food? Where God told him to go. Not before he got there. Okay? Hallelujah. For men like Elijah, listening, obeying the Spirit of the Lord, and stepping out on faith, step at a time. I have ordered the ravens. So, verse 5, so he did what the Lord told him. That'll preach right there for a while, won't it? He had a word of the Lord. He gave it. Now he has a specific word about his provision and protection. And now he obeyed it too. Okay? So he did what the Lord told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Wow. Not one meal a day, but two. Bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. I was in South Sudan a few years back, and we were going to these villages with these different tribes with scars they marked on their boys' heads when they turned 13 or something. It was kind of weird. Man, these people had got a hold of the truth, and they're building this little stick church and stuff. We were going around for the few days, and, you know, the guys leading us uh, fed me and Jack some breakfast. And then later that evening, we had some supper. And one day we asked them about lunch. And they said, what is that? The people in South Sudan didn't eat three meals a day. They only ate two. So praise God, this was a blessing. There's a famine in the land in Elijah. So I said, okay, just go by your culture. You don't have to change for us. We'll be all right. Okay, we won't, you don't need lunch while we're in South Sudan. So... Uh, these people here, God fed him in the morning, during a famine, and in the evening. Not just the steak, but the wheat roll that came with it. Bread and meat. Amen? Now, so this happened for a while. Now, I want you to put yourself in the place. Elijah declared that there's no rain coming. And ever since he declared it, there's no rain. So now this brook he's at, that's feeding into, he's starting to go down lower and lower and lower. Okay? And God's got another place for him to go. Okay? There's, there's a step. 
And then there's another step. Now he tells us, now there's famine in the land, and Jezebel's mad in Ahab, and they're looking for Elijah to kill him. He's the one they think that brought this disaster upon them because he speaks the word of the Lord. You know? We're going to speak the word of the Lord in the face of fallen government. We're going to speak the truth and you'll be hated. But be ready for it. And how are you going to respond? In the workplace, with a political enemy against you speaking things, how are you going to respond? In anger and fight and fuss? Or the way Christ did in love and speak truth? So, here we go. What happens next? Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Well, God, I stepped out in faith and obeyed you. Now look at this, what's happening. Man, you got to step out in faith and do what's next. God, I obeyed you with the first thing and now it's not working anymore. Well, get another word of where he's leading you next. Amen? Hallelujah. God, we tried this, this, and this. Now what you want us to do? Hallelujah. Sometime later, the brook dried up. Then the Word of the Lord came to him. I'm so glad that you and I can walk with the Word of the Lord every day. There was a time in this book for 400 years before Christ, that the word of the Lord was rare. But we have the living word in us. And he can speak to us and lead us every day. Isn't that amazing? Y'all okay? Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath and Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. He had already commanded a widow before Elijah got there. It didn't say when he got there, all of a sudden the widow saw Elijah and he stirred her up to supply. No, no. He, he said, my word has gone. I have already commanded a widow who's already there and I have commanded her to supply you with food. Now, I'm not going to tell you how that's going to happen or you might not believe me or might not go. I'm going to pull some more miracles all out of the hat there. I'm going to do this again. I've got a plan to work for the big picture, you just have to obey my word and go. But God, Sidon isn't even Israel. It's north of Israel in another land with other kings and other ways of worship. Why are you sending me there? Because I said so. I'm ordering you to go there. And I'm going to feed you with a woman who's not even an Israelite. I'm going to feed you there. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to tell you to go to South Sudan. Okay, I'm going to do something different. So he says, okay, go at once. Verse 10, so he went to Zarephath. He obeyed. Man needed to. The brook was drying up and the ravens weren't coming anymore. And God gave him a word where the next supply is. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I can have a drink? Elijah knew who she was. He's walking with God and said, hey, there's a widow. God, he didn't just see a widow gathering sticks. He saw the widow. He knew down in his knower, that's the one. Speak to her. God's already commanded her, and maybe she doesn't even know it but she's going to know it when I speak the word. So here she's gathering sticks, an old widow struggling. And he's going to say, hey, give me something. Hmm. Watch this. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I can have a drink? As she was going to get it, wow, she obeyed right away. Something in this in this voice that just came out in this man you recognize hey he's asking for water i'm gonna go do it as she was going to get it he called hey and bring me a piece of bread too wow i've done that a few times not many do you know we got people coming here every week asking for food money clothes shelter this that 
in over 20 years, you, this church, have been giving those people a word and blessing them with whatever way as the Lord leads. But a lot of times, I think I'm going to regroup and take this. Sometimes, you know, I'll give them a word and invite them to church and tell them to come and stuff. But Elijah said, hey, you do this first. Like taking a widow, somebody poor can't pay this. You say, hey, I want you to give the church something first. I want you to make a commitment that you'll be here Wednesday night first. I want you to step out. I'm going to give you a word. Now you act on that word and then God will bless you. It seems backwards to our social gospel thinking. But that's what Elijah did. He said, okay, look, here's a widow woman. There's been famine. See, the famine in Israel have affected Sidon as well. It was a regional famine. It was huge. People all over were starving. And this widow was dying too in her household. And he said, hey, go get me some water. She said, okay. And then he said, hey, and go ahead and bring me a piece of bread too. Wow. Wow. As sure, and then she said, Verse 12, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to, take, to go home and make my meal for myself and my son so we may eat it and die. Man, even though God had stirred her up to feed this prophet, she had a lot of doubt and lack of faith and was speaking a very negative word about it, wasn't she? He's saying, hey, look, prophet, look, you, you just called on me and pulling on me, and let me tell you where I'm at. I've got a little bit left, enough to make one more meal. We're going to eat this, and the famine's so bad, we have nothing left. We're going to eat this, and then we're ready to die. But there's something about the word in you that's stirring my heart even while I'm speaking negatively. This guy's different. There's something about what he's saying that stirs me a bit, and I'm willing to listen to him one more time till I write him off. And then look what happens. Elijah said to her, now he gives her. She already had a partial word. She had a word that God's going to send a, a prophet and she's supposed to feed him. She had that because God had ordained it ahead of time. I have ordered a widow to feed you. He had already done it. But now she, her faith is wavering. She's doubting a bit. She thinks she's going to die. She don't know. And now she needs a more specific word. And praise God, the word of God shows up in her life. And he says this. Elijah told her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. Make that last cake. But first, make me a small cake of bread for me and what you have, and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. Put God first in everything you do. The 1st of January, 2021, we're giving it to Him, fasting and praying. We're turning off some other stuff, maybe your TV or your cell phone, and we're going to read the Word together. We're gathering our families and coming to church, and we're saying no matter what shakes in the government, Lord God, your kingdom is my first loyalty, you. I'm going to follow you, and I will not be shaken. And I'll not curse the darkness, but I'll shine the light. For this is what the Lord says. You do this, what I'm asking you. For this is what the Lord of God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. I'm telling you, give. And it shall be given to you, which you give first. Well, God, let me see how that's going to work out first. You supply the ravens and supply the brook and supply all this, and then I might think about this tithe thing or this thing. No, no, no. You give your first, and he'll bless the rest. You don't pay all your bills and take care of yourself first and say, God, if I have anything left, I'll give you a little something on Sunday. No, you dedicate in your heart, Lord God, you're first in my life. And as I step out and obey you, then you'll bless the rest. Hallelujah. So, she says, she hears the word of the Lord. Now she believes it, 
And now she's encouraged because now she's got something. Now this is not just her, the prophet, the, the man who said it's not going to rain and it didn't. Now here he is and he says, you know, you go do this and your jug will never run dry. Now her faith is stirred. She just heard the word of the Lord and she believes it. How do we know she believes it? Because she did it. That's how we'll know you believe it. When you start acting on the word you receive. Hallelujah. Praise God. She went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah. She kept him, man. She had the prophet of God at, his, at her house. And for the woman and her family, the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the words spoken by Elijah. It didn't say he piled up a bunch of jugs and a bunch of flour. It said that one little jug didn't run dry. In another story, he piled up a bunch of jugs. This time he said that oil never ran dry. Reminds me, Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. Take care of me today, Lord. Take care of us today. Show us what to do today and we'll do it. And now that I'll know you'll show us what to do tomorrow. Hallelujah. Lord, supply. Hey, you, I'm stepping out in faith and doing what you told me today. And you'll supply and provide and take care of and bless. And then I'll step out and do what you tell me tomorrow. And you'll supply and provide. And Lord God, and my life will be a witness to all those around me who are in the darkness. And we'll continue to step out in faith and we'll continue to walk with you and be provided by you and share your word. We're going to walk this thing out. Hallelujah. And then... Praise God, the, the rest of the story. And her son grew ill. Through all of this blessing, and then now her son grows ill and dies. And people say, Lord God, I stepped on her, out in faith. I started going to church. I got married. I started doing this. And now this other bad thing's happened and died. And she, she's upset, man. She, God, why did you, you do this? Telling Elijah. And Elijah did something. And I'll give you a little nugget right here that had never been done in the history of the Scripture. This is the first time in Scripture you see someone raised from the dead. There's a lot of miracles in Moses' time and a lot of miracles, but here's the first time that a man of God... So Elijah had no precedent on it. He didn't say, well, I'm going to do what Moses did in this situation or I'm going to do what Joshua did. No, no, no. He just was carrying the Word of God and the Word of God is alive and powerful like in his bones, it's, the word of God is Jesus. So the life, the resurrection life of Christ was in Elijah because he had the word. And I'm telling you, the word and Christ are one. So man, what did he do? He acted on the word and he stretched himself out over that boy and prayed. He was dead and cold and he did it again and he did it again. And then he picked that boy up who came back to life and carried him back down to his mama. The resurrection life is in you. The power of the Lord, the spirit of Elijah is upon us. The life-given word is already there. You know what? The curse he spoke that came from the law, hallelujah, that there'd be no rain, Jesus removed the curse. And now because of him, we walk in the blessing so I'm going to speak a word as Elijah did over you right now. And you can bro believe it and step out in it and proclaim it and speak it yourself. Hallelujah. Or you can reject it, not believe it, not say it. See, the word's already alive. That, word, that word thing wouldn't have happened. If Elijah didn't go say it, it wouldn't have happened. You have to believe it and act on it. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we studied your word in Kings and studied the story of Elijah, I'm reminded in James that says the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. That Elijah was a man just like us. And he prayed that it didn't rain and it didn't for three and a half years. And then he prayed that it would and it did. 
So, Lord, you're giving us an example in James that we are like Elijah, men like him, and the Spirit of God is in us and upon us so we can believe like he did and see miracles and see life and see healing and see, I decree in the name of Jesus that this church, hallelujah, will continue to act and walk on the word of the Lord. And as we step out in faith, God's going to continue to move and bless and heal and deliver more and more as we see his return approaching. We're going to grow in the very image of Christ and become more like him. And this church and you and your ministry will see more healing, see more blind eyes open, deaf um, healed, people raised from the dead, provision come supernaturally. There's shaking coming to the world and there's more shaking coming to America and we're going to be standing on the solid rock and the life of God that was in the life of Elijah is going to flow through each and every one of you. More and more as we get closer to the return of our King. Hallelujah. God bless you all. Go in peace. Go in the truth. Go shine the light in the darkness. God bless you. Have a great week. Tyler's going to be preaching more on Kings Wednesday night. If you're not used to coming on Wednesday night, change your schedule and come this Wednesday. In Jesus' name, God bless you.